uh, without further delay, I'd like to introduce our, our guest speaker uh, for today. Uh, as you both read, it is uh, Dr. Tom Phillips. And I'll just say a little bit about Tom. Uh, it's a, a, a fitting that he'll be presenting at, at SEPTLA. Uh, he received his MLS from Drexel University, which of course is located within SEPTLA uh, geographically. Uh, he earned a PhD from Southern Methodist University uh, and is the Dean of Library and Information Resources at Claremont School of Theology. I did some of my dissertation work uh, at Claremont School of Theology and Tom was very um, hospitable uh, and uh, willing to participate in, uh, in research and so a debt of gratitude is certainly owed there. Um, Tom has written several books and edited many more, presented at national conferences, so it's really our privilege to welcome him today, uh, the founder and director of the Digital Theological Library, the Open Access Digital Theological Library, and the Global Digital Theological Library. Tom, it's great to have you with us. Unmute myself. Uh, thanks, Patrick. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what um, your all interest is. I can talk about a lot of things, but I'd prefer to talk about what's interested, what you're interested in. I can give you a little background about the Digital Theological Library. Um, in hey, 2000, Tom, but just sorry, this is Lydia speaking. Um, just I think what we had discussed was sort of a history of how. Uh, t uh, uh, the DTL came to be like the process of bringing it into existence as it were. So I don't know if yeah. that kind of fits with what you were thinking. Of. Yeah. Okay. You know, I, I can address that. Uh, yeah. In 2000, uh, I came to CST in 2013. We were working on uh, starting a hybrid program where they do one week online and uh, the rest of the semester or one week uh, in person, the rest of the semester online. Back in those days, that's all that um, uh, that's all that ATS would accredit. And of course, things are different now. But uh, and at Claremont, we had the philosophical commitment that graduate education requires students to do library research, to ask an original research question: What's the truth about X, Y, or Z? And then to answer that question in dialogue with the best of contemporary scholarship and the primary resources is relevant. Um, if they're going to do that non residentially, you need to have a robust digital library. So I was tasked with doing that. As you all know, that becomes very expensive very quickly. And what I noticed very quickly was that the minimum, and uh, I came to librarianship after being a professor for 15 years. So uh, I was fairly new to librarianship at the time. I'd got my MLS at the transition, but it's fairly new. And I saw that all these licenses were written with a minimum FTE of 2,500, but that we could not share the content. So even though our FTE was around 200, we were buying 10 times the capacity we needed. We couldn't share that excess capacity. And I was doing what all good librarians do. I was complaining to the CFO and uh, he said, well, what we need to do is set up a separate nonprofit corporation, license everything to that and have that nonprofit corporation owned by multiple libraries. Uh, that conversation took place in October of 15. So then I did what all good trained information professionals do. I began to Google and how do you set up a nonprofit? Uh, we set up the nonprofit in uh, January of 16, we went live with the DTL with two, pe two members in July of 16. Uh, today, just yesterday, Patrick and Lydia don't know this, but just yesterday the DTL reached its full capacity. What we did, we, I talked to the vendors initially and licensed all the content for 2500 to the Digital Theological Library, said uh, we're only going by FTE, not number of schools. So. Um, the vendors went along with this. Then we got to 2,500. I saw that if we got to 4,400, we could pretty much uh, buy everything we were interested in, pay our people and be self-sustaining without any, uh, originally the idea was that Claremont would subsidize the DTL 
in perpetuity pay a disproportionate share. But uh, when we moved to 4,400, that became unnecessary. Just yesterday, we had our 4,400. We have just shy of 40 schools that co-own the Digital Theological Library. So the process of how we did it, we had to set up a nonprofit so we'd have a licensing agency. I, I did a um, presentation on this at um, the 10 steps to set up the DTL at, uh, in Europe a few years ago. If you want, I can send you the PowerPoint. Uh, but uh, the first thing we had to do was set up a nonprofit corporation. So we set up a nonprofit corporation that takes a few months here in California. So we had somebody to license to. And then the second thing we had to do was make sure that every member that started uh, as part of this organization was in fact a co-owner of the nonprofit. And we did that so that we weren't a consortium or some third party licensing agency. We we're one library in the same way that across the street from me, the Claremont colleges or seven independent colleges, they all share one library in common in the middle of the library, in the middle of the uh, campus. And that's what we said, that's what we're gonna do, but our campuses are gonna be scattered all over the United States. And now then they're scattered all over the world. We have libraries in, in Asia, Europe, uh, across North America, um, one in the Middle East. But uh, that was the most important thing that we set up a nonprofit and we set up the nonprofit so that all of the participating libraries became co-owners of that library so that we weren't redistributing the licenses or we weren't uh, redistributing content license to one organization. And then for the governance, every school has representation on the board, $1 into it equals $1 or one vote on the board. And we set the fees based on the number of students. So some of the schools uh, that are startups that have, you know, single digit students are paying a couple thousand dollars. Other schools like Gordon Conwell are paying in excess of a hundred grand. Uh, but the idea is that we can build something bigger and better together than we can possibly build separately because we're sharing not just the acquisitions costs, but also the cost of librarianship because we're not repeating the exact same work across 40 different institutions. We're centralizing the work in one place and that saves an immense amount of personnel cost. Uh, most of the schools that join the DTL, uh, like say, I think Matt would be okay with this, New Brunswick, if, if they tried to do something like uh, the kind of content we have in the DTL, if they tried to do that on their own, they couldn't even hire a librarian to make it work for the price they're paying for membership in the, uh, in the DTL. But the central idea on the history, and I'll stop in a second, let you ask questions if you have specific questions, is what we had to do was set up a uh, 501c3 with uh, bylaws that were very clear that it was co-ownership and co-ownership contingent upon annual membership fees. Uh, then we set up a governing board. Then we went to, the, I spent about six months between January and July just negotiating with vendors I got a few to sign on early and then as we became more established, now then people reach out to me all the time and want to do business with us because quite frankly, we have a more robust acquisitions budget than most theological libraries. But the hard part was convincing people to start out with, no, this is something different. And everybody said, oh, so you're a consortium. No, we are not a consortium. We're a member of a consortium, Skelk. But what a consortium does is negotiate the price and then each member can decide whether or not they purchase that content directly from the vendor for that price. What we do is we are one library co-owned by almost 40 seminaries around the world. Um, that, that's sort of a quick version. If you have specific questions, I'm happy to answer them. My wife said last night, you're gonna give away all your trade secrets. I said, well, not really trade secrets. But if you have questions or comments, or even uh, if you want to see what the DTL looks like, I'm happy to do that. The other thing I would say is we got really aggressive early on curating open access content. Uh, we use OCLC's WorldShare as our discovery tool. Uh, the DTL doesn't even have patron module because we don't need patron accounts. We're not checking anything literally out. Uh, so we only have the uh, discovery and the knowledge base. Uh, but we got very aggressive about curating OA content. 
And then when we got to about 100,000 OA con titles in our collection, uh, we created the Open Access Digital Theological Library, which is free for everyone everywhere in the world. We have uh, about 100,000 regular users now in uh, over 180 countries. So it's really uh, aggressively used. And like I said, that's free for anyone anywhere in the world. That cost us about 5,000 because all we have is the discovery. We don't even have an easy proxy for that since it's free. And we just copy the collections from the DTL to the OA DTL to make them available to people. And then uh, we started that, I think in 17. And then last year we started the global DTL, which is on the same model as the DTL, but it's only for schools in developing nations. We have about 40 schools involved in that also. We use our vendors of goodwill, we call them. Our vendors of goodwill have given us extraordinarily good deals on stuff uh, so that we limit it to schools in developing nations. And that's not limited by FTE. We could have every school in the developing world uh, join that if we wanted. Uh, some of the vendors actually give us that content. Others uh, provide it at deep discounts. Uh, but we're, we also run, so now we run those three libraries, the global for the developing world, the digital theological library, which is robust, comprehensive research library for developed nations, and then the free version, the OADTL. Uh, if you have qu specific questions or comments, I'm happy to hear. Uh, thank you, Tom. I, uh... I, I thought that you know, the, the model of the DTL uh, seemed very innovative. And hearing it now that it really started with the conversation with your C CFO, um, I guess that's, that's how it started with, with thinking, you know, thinking a little outside of the box of normal you know, library operating procedures. Um, uh, yeah, some... it, it did. And uh, what I was trying to get around was the problem that I was buying more capacity than I needed, but I couldn't legally share that capacity with anyone else. And so he came up with the idea of forming this 501c3. I wrote a proposal for the president and the dean and the CFO was already on board. Uh, they approved it, then we went to CST's board. And what we, the reason we were able to do this is CST was spending about $300,000 a year on digital content at the time. And so I convinced the board to actually turn that $300,000 a year over to the DTL on the hopes that the DTL would take off and in the long run save them money. Uh, it did work out that way, but it was a big risk for the board to take because had the DTL failed, then they would have just lost that money. Uh, so you really need, uh, the big part if someone was gonna replicate this project, the hard part would be finding either a cohort of schools that say we're willing to buy in initially to, for the startup capital or external funding that was willing to do that or one school that was willing to put their money in it. But you, you somehow have to come up with a startup capital. That's the real challenge. And depending on your state law, uh, starting a nonprofit corporation can take several months. Uh, and then there are all kinds of compliance hoops that you have to figure out to maintain your nonprofit status with your state and with the feds. But um, yeah, it's, we, we're considering starting a DTL too, but since we just filled up the DTL yesterday, that's, that would, we'd have to talk to the board about that. It would take a while. The other thing is when you're starting, you have to be emphatic with all your vendors uh, this is one library. We are not a consortium. We are one library co-owned. I mean, the co-ownership was the essential piece because that's what gave us the right to bring in new members uh, within our FTE and not to be charged more money for more members. Um, yeah, that, that was essential. Um, and if somebody was going to do this, I could tell, I could put them in touch with the companies that are easiest to work with. At this point, the only, the only vendor who will not work with us is Atla. 
because Atlas model is based on uh, selling their product to each and every seminary independently. And the DTL uh, is a mortal threat to their business model that they're afraid. Uh, so they're the only ones who won't license us now. We have relationships over a hundred vendors. Uh, our acquisitions budgets half a million dollars a year. So we, we buy aggressively. We're also getting into controlled digital lending now, but that's a different issue. So Tom, how, I just sort of thinking, I know that um, you said that the detail just sort of finished getting filled up. So um, I, one of the reasons that we wanted to invite you is because this is, we've talked for years uh, as a consortium about doing something similar to the DTL, but we've never sort of had anybody who was able to kind of spearhead it and lead it into an actual completed project. So I guess, what would you say was kind of the time investment in getting it off the ground in the first place? Yeah. From your uh, end. Yeah. The, the CST was all in on this. So, uh, you know, we had five people, six people in the CST library at the time um, that I was in my office every morning between January and July of, of 16 at six o'clock in the morning and didn't leave until six o'clock at night. And that whole time I was on the phone uh, convincing people uh, that this was a good idea, that we should do it, that uh, the vendors should go along. Uh, the, some of the first vendors I got were sort of marginal to religious studies. And so then what finally I got to the point where people was, and every conversation takes forever. Like, oh, what are you doing? Oh, you're a consortium. We already, no, no, we're not a consortium. Oh, well, and then you talk somebody into it, you know, some salesperson who gets paid by commission. And then they go talk to the boss and boss say, no, no, that's a consortium. And then you have to start the conversation over with another level. Then you'd get convinced a regional sales manager. Then you'd have to go to the national sales manager. Then you'd have to go to the vice president. That's why it took me six months. Uh, but I mean, I, essentially, I, that's all I did for six months. Uh, 12 hours, Monday through Friday. I, every morning, because these people are all on the East Coast and I was on the West Coast, I had to be in my office at six o'clock. Otherwise, by the time I came to my office at nine, they'd be out for lunch. Then I'd go to lunch, come back, and they'd, be, they'd start to leave for the day. So, yeah. Uh, but it, it's an immense amount of effort. Uh, and anybody who didn't think so would really be underplaying it. Um, and then uh, it would be easier for us to do something now because we already have all these vendor relationships. Uh, here's the one thing I would say. Be brutally honest at every point. Uh, and that's not just ethical advice, it's practical advice that uh, because you're trying to do something that they, they're going to figure out the scam, the truth anyway, they're going to get the dirt on it anyway. But if they feel like you're being deceptive with them, they're not going to cut you any slack. And so my policy is tell the truth, tell the truth all the time and tell more truth than is necessary. And routinely, I tell the vendors that I say, now, you know, I don't have to tell you this at this point, but I want to tell you what we're doing. You know, we want to eventually get to this size that, and all this. And that actually made it a lot easier because uh, like when I dealt with Credo Reference on the global DTL, um, they were trying to figure this out and said, so you want to be able to give our content to everybody in the developing world who's doing religious studies? I said, yes. <laughs> he said, uh, Everybody, I said, yes. He said, well, at least you're honest. So they gave it to us for the price of one school. Uh, yeah, but uh, yeah, that would be the one thing. It's a big, big commitment of time and you're gonna deal with a lot of people. You might as well not even talk to Atla. That's not gonna happen. Uh, no, their, their price, yeah. I mean, uh, they think what I'm doing is a mortal threat to their very existence. Um, but if you don't believe me, you can talk to them sometime and act like you're sort of suspicious of me and they'll tell you what they really think because it's come back to me often enough. But uh, you can get Atla content, but what you have to do is work with people like Project Muse and JSTOR and you'll get those same journals. They'll just be in a different uh, venue. 
the other thing I would say is with discovery, uh, you really have to go with OCLC's world share. And the reason is it's the only ones vendor neutral. If you go with, um, say Primo, then it's owned by ProQuest. And it's a thinly veiled marketing tool that it's just going to show you ProQuest content and your results. Same thing with EBSCO Discovery, that if those, they bought the, the companies bought those discovery tools so that they could push their content. And then they changed the algorithm. So if you use an EBSCO Discovery, the only thing you're going to find is EBSCO content. The only ones truly vendor neutral is OCLC. Um, and OCLC doesn't say it that bluntly, but it's still true. Um, yeah, I, I talked a lot. Did I answer your question, Lydia? Yeah, no, that, yeah, that was very, that was pretty much exactly what I was wondering. Um, and yeah, so. What does it take to sustain the DTL now? When you talk about we, um, who are the, who are the we who are actually doing the. This? Yeah, the, the DTL board met last week or week before last, uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, and we meet three times a year. We're creating an executive council who will meet more often. Uh, they approved our budget for next year at a million dollars from the 40 schools, and that's proportional to their size. Uh, the hard work of establishing the detail is done. Uh, with, now that we're at our 4,400 cap, we'll have about $1.2 million in revenue. Uh, I work full-time for the DTL. Drew Baker works full-time for the DTL. He's our metadata librarian as I have the role of executive director and he's managing director. Um, the only difference between those two really is uh, he does a lot more technical work and I sign checks, um, negotiate contracts. Then we have an army of part-time workers. Uh, in the other room is Fiona. We have uh, about a dozen part-time professionals who work for us on an hour by hour basis. One who does lib guides, one who does the web page. Uh, the rest all do metadata. Plus, we have an army of interns. At any one time, I'll be supervising uh, four to 12 interns who uh, all do metadata work. So the, the I, mean, I mean, we have some compliance issues. We have to turn in tax forms and stuff. But uh, the hard work of running, of starting the detail is over. So how long, like, um, I guess, at, at what point did it functionally start to be its own entity with its own yeah, staff I, and sort of being able to self-support um, as opposed to simply borrowing time from, um, what, you know, the library staff members at Claremont? Yeah, and I, I don't know if I said this, I was thinking it, but... Uh, the reason I was able to do that at Claremont, like I said, there were six of us, that all I did was work on the DTL and the other people actually did all of the work for the Claremont Library. I was doing almost nothing. Once in a while, they'd come in and ask me what I'd think about something. And I'd say, well, what are you thinking? And then I'd say, oh, that's a great idea. Do exactly what you're thinking. Uh, but, you know, I mean, I wouldn't even know how to check out a book. I, I've never been behind the circulation desk. Um, the, and so, it, but it's not just... Uh, library personnel time, which is a big deal because I mean, I spend a lot of time on this. Uh, it's also the startup capital that I was talking about earlier. What Claremont said is we're willing, you know, we're willing to put our time, your time, you can work on this exclusively for the, you know, as long as you need to, to make it work. And you can use the library staff as you think is appropriate. I mean, we make sure our other functions get done, but use the library staff as appropriate. So Drew Baker and Ann Hidago did tons of work on it uh, starting up. Uh, but there was also a startup capital. So they, uh, so Claremont took its acquisitions budget and turned it over to the DTL. Uh, it was, I made a chart for the board uh, that when we got to the DTL had about 750,000 in revenue. That's where we ceased to be subsidized by CST. The CST subsidy, you know, them paying a disproportionate part of the acquisitions lasted about three years. The reason CST was willing to do that between 2016, about two years, I guess, 2016, 2018, it's because they had a long-term view that this would give them a much better library at a much lower rate. And it has worked out that way. 
This year, CSTE's contribution is $105,000 for what's going to be about a $1.2 million library operation. So, I mean, they're getting the payback on their investment, but yet they had to put that money up front and take the risk that it was going to work out. Uh, yeah. That uh, if somebody wanted to do it now, uh, I mean, probably the way to do it would be to have a cohort of schools and to have the DTL uh, set up a second library with that cohort of schools uh, because a lot of the work, well, we already have the expertise and a lot of the work uh, would be a lot easier if we were doing it because we could copy collections and stuff. Uh, but what you would really need is a cohort of schools and a pot of money that was committed to making this work with a one with more than a one year vision. So it's not like a database, you try it for a year, if it doesn't work, you cancel it. Uh, of the 40 schools that we have in the DTL, there's only one that did not, uh, has not continued. It was actually the first school that joined. They only remember one year and they said, there's too much content in here. <laughs> uh, our, our users- Too much? Confused. Yeah. Uh, that, they said our members get confused. And besides that, our mission is just to teach people this body of text. So we don't need that much stuff. Uh, but uh, that was sort of an anomaly. Uh, but everybody else is in this for the long term. And for some of them now, it's the only library they have. But one of the things important, we don't do reference. We only do collections so that the lo the reference is a local library function that the local librarians do. So if somebody sends us a, a paper saying, a note saying, I'm doing a paper on the Trinity, can you help me find stuff? We say, talk to your local librarian. Uh, the DTL for a few of the schools contracts with for reference services. And what I do is hire a part-time person who works reference, and then he or she will interact with the patron, uh, bill the DTL and the B B DTL then bills the school. But that's really very small schools that don't have a librarian. Yeah. Uh, so for, for participants in a theoretical cohort, what would the capital that they would contribute you know, look like? Like what percentage would go towards, say, acquisitions? What percentage would need to go towards you know, something else that's involved with getting something like this off the ground? Well, the average uh, academic library um, spends a, or, or the average academic library spends about 40% of its revenue on content and about 60% on other, uh, other support. Um, to be honest, we haven't thought enough about this question uh, because a lot of it would be um, duplicate effort or would be, uh, there'd be an economy of scale that would be in a but what I would say is you'd probably figure half of the, what was spent would be directly on content. The, uh, that's about what the DTL does. About half of what's spent goes directly to either purchase or lease content. The other thing I would say is uh, in the DTL, we made the philosophical decision. We're going to buy content, not lease it because the leasing stuff that's, um, that can be a disaster because you, if the only way you can get more content is by canceling some of your existing content. We also are really big fans of patron driven acquisition. So like um, we buy all of Bloomsbury's content, you know, we've already bought the content for next year. Uh, we buy all their content ahead of time, but uh, uh, like Wiley and Francis and Taylor, we have, tens of thousands of their volumes and it's purchased and it's uh, evidence-based. So we send them like 20 grand a year. They give us access to everything at the end of the year, we turn some over to long-term, but I, I'm really skeptical of leases and that system. So we do, uh, we do a lot of firm orders through Gobi too, but uh, I, to answer your question directly, I'd say probably around 50%. The other thing I would say philosophically to think through is if you're going to do this for databases and with journals, you almost have to do leases, databases, or if you're going to do it with books. If you're doing it with books, you can buy them and own them and have permanent rights. 
if you're going to do it with journals, you're pretty much permanently relying upon your third party leasing agents uh, because they're the only ones who really have the article level metadata. My advice would be just concentrate on books. Thank you, Tom. And the vendors are way, way more generous with contracts on books than they are databases and journals. Way more generous. Uh, are there other questions from the, the member libraries here? Tom, could you say a little bit more about your forays into CDL? Yeah, we just started that. What happened was Claremont is moving, the school is moving to Salem, Oregon to embed in Willamette University. And so the president called me over and four year, three years ago before the faculty knew anything about it and stuff said, hey, here's what we're probably gonna do. You need to price out building a new library up there. And I said, you're gonna get sticker shock. <laughs> Libraries are expensive. And then moving, it's gonna be really expensive. Uh, my suggestion is don't do it. And he's like, what? The librarians tell me not to build a library. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. So what we had about 300,000 dead tree books. <clears throat> so what we did was, uh, and by the way, on the DTL, uh, when I got here in 2013, uh, the previous year, we'd had 48,000 print transactions. We have a PhD program, so we have robust research projects going on, and our faculty publish regularly, but 48,000. Uh, last year, the last year, the CST traditional library was open, we had 7,000. The reason is everybody shifted to the digital content. Um, but what I told him was, let's move 20,000 volumes, and that'll be everything that's not in the DTL and that has been used in the last 15 years and everything that is mission critical like Methodist stuff or uh, particularly valuable. This is about 20,000 volumes. Um, he, he went crazy and so we ended up moving 50,000 volumes but uh, and put them in the Hatfield Library up there so we did away with our special theological library. But when we did that, then the quarter of a million books we had, what are we gonna do with these? Uh, I talked to the Internet Archive and the, we, we donated all of those to the Internet Archive, quarter of a million books. They're gonna put them in their control or in their uh, controlled digital lending project, which was the first time I'd heard of controlled digital lending. And it's like, hmm, that's interesting. Uh, and so after they moved those, then the DTL started doing the same thing. What we do is, um, we buy print books, we guillotine them, scan them. We buy a, usually buy a new copy to begin with. And then we buy three or four of the oldest acceptable copies on Amazon. And then we go to used book sales. We have a, a theological library. Yesterday I bought uh, 2000 books for $3,000 religious studies book from a used book dealer. I'm going next week to pick up uh, uh, about another 4,000 from a theological library that's downsizing. But what we do is get the books we want, guillotine them, scan them, keep track of how many copies we have. We make that many copies available to our users. And we don't allow downloads for those because if they downloaded them, the idea with controlled digital lending, for those of you who haven't followed this, the idea is a library can buy a book and for sale, they can loan that book out a thousand times, but one person at a time. Controlled digital lending works on the same principle. We'll loan out, let's say we have five copies in storage, we'll loan that PDF out to five people at a time, but only five people. So we're one print copy, one digital copy available. So uh, that's what we do. Um, and then we don't allow downloads because if they downloaded them, they would be able to keep them forever. And we, that ruined the one-to-one -one principle. Um, but they can view them online and they can print them out one page at a time through their browser if they want. They just can't uh, print out the whole book and they can't download the whole book so that we comply with copyright. Uh, we don't use uh, Adobe Digital Editions like a lot of people do. Instead, what we do is we send them to our Dropbox account, which is protected so not anyone can get into it. And then we look at the statistics to see how many books, how many copies of a book have been used. And if one's used uh, more than we have copies, we buy another used copy and throw it in storage. But that doesn't happen very often. 
Uh, typically, we when we acquire a book, if it's one that we think uh, is like, uh, say, Anchor Bible Dictionary, we just buy three or four copies to begin with and throw in storage. Or um, uh, if it's a textbook, like there's a Hebrew textbook people are using, we have 10 copies in storage. Then we just scan through the usage statistics on Dropbox and see how many simultaneous users we had. We haven't had a problem with hitting limits, but that's the method we use. Um, it's the metadata work is kind of laborious because we send them from WMS where they do discovery into our libguide page and that libguide page is IP protected. Then it has the password at the Dropbox where we send them the Dropbox, they enter the password and they can see it. So they can view it online, they can print it out a page at a time, just like photocopying it in the library but they can't download it for the controlled digital ending. Um, and it gets a lot of use. And there are a lot of books that you can't get at any price digitally that like Anchor Bible Dictionary, Interpreter's Bible Dictionary, Interpreter's Bible Commentary, lots of things like that that we've digitized. Uh, we're probably, I need to talk to the board about this, but we're probably gonna make that CDL collection available to libraries and maybe eventually to individuals on a sort of a Netflix subscription model, but I've got to talk to the board about that and get board approval before we do that. But that's the long-term plan. Did I answer your question, uh, Greg? Yeah, thanks, Tom. It's really interesting. Thank you. Uh, there's a group called CDLI. Um, I don't remember. The CDL is Controlled Digital Lending. I don't remember what the I stands for, uh, there are a lot of R1s involved in this, trying to figure out the best way to do controlled digital lending. We meet once a month to talk about it. Uh, if you send me an email, I can uh, hook you up with that group. But they're kind of secretive because they don't want publishers, uh, they don't want publishers going in there to try to figure out how to wreck it. Um, so, but I can hook you up with that group. Our CDL collection right now, we have about 600 volumes in it and, or 600 titles, you know, things like Anchor Bible Dictionary, one title, six volumes, but about 600 titles, but we're adding things aggressively. We add a couple hundred a week. I don't want to take all your time. Do you have any other comments or questions? Can I jump in for a minute? This is Evelyn from Princeton. Can you hear Hi, me? Hi. Yeah. Hi, Tom. Uh, you probably already know from my email to you that PTS is involved in CDL, um, and Greg, of course, leads that initiative. I'm, I'm curious to know, for the donated collection to the Internet Archive, which yeah. is a wonderful thing, thank you very much for doing that, did they give you any kind of a time frame for getting they did. With Oh, yeah. Uh, I, uh, that because we were the first ones to do this and then evangelical, which is there in Pennsylvania, maybe somebody, uh, I guess they went, uh, evangelical merged with another seminary. They were there in Pennsylvania. They were a member of the digital theological library. And, uh, when they closed, they donated about 80,000 volumes to the, uh, to the internet archive also. And then what they did is merge their membership in the DTL with the other schools, because uh, one of the things their board insisted on when they closed their campus was that their students didn't lose access to the DTL. But they gave me a time frame. I've worked with uh, Brewster and Chris and um, Jordan there a lot, uh, trade a lot of emails and text with them. Uh, very easy to work with. They say that now our books are in the Philippines. They, they took them off campus in June they are in the Philippines where they will be digitized. Uh, they said that uh, two to three years for the full collection to be digitized and available. They said um, that's working at their sort of their normal pace. I don't know how much you know about the archive, but of course Brewster has billions and he funds it and what he cares about he funds. But they said probably two to three years uh, for the full collection to be accessible through controlled digital lending in the archive. Uh, and they were really, really excited to get this collection because it was a curated library collection. Uh, interestingly now, the Internet Archive 
is quickly becoming one of the largest theological libraries in the nation <laughs> or in the world. Um, and uh, that's good for us. Yeah. Uh, we do but, actually, just to follow up, um, we have been involved with Internet Archive for some time. PTS has been hosting a regional scanning site in our building since, yeah. Greg can correct me on this, but I think since around 2008. That's yeah. right. Uh, and uh, the difference is, of course, the stuff we were doing wasn't just public domain, but it was in copyright. So they're doing the controlled rather than yeah. the, uh, than the uh, free to read collections. Um, that uh, the problem is for the things you most want, you're going to have a wait. You know, like like if you wanted, say, Anchor Bible Dictionary, they only have volume six or last time I checked they did. Uh, so some of the things you most want and uh, aren't there or some of the things you most want are going to have a wait. You know, if you're talking about like uh, that Hebrew textbook I was talking about, if they have a copy of that, you know, the students couldn't ever count on it being there you know, or being accessible. There would always be a line uh, to get access because of the one book, one, one user rule. I will put it out there that we've been uh, taking some opportunistic um, advantage of what we put into our CDL collection, but I'll put it out to the community that Princeton is happy to have a conversation with Sepla and with you, Tom, about how we can help in the things that we put forward in our collection for the CDL. So if there is a way in which we can coordinate and be of assistance to the community, we're happy to have that conversation. Here's, whenever. What, here's what I think would be really good. Uh, that if we set up some kind of exchange so people could exchange the PDFs. So we didn't have the cost of the scanning because, you know, we can share the PDF. Now, we would have to make sure that people who got the PDF then see, uh, sequestered their print volume so that we really do, we're doing controlled digital lending. But if there's no reason for every one of us to make this a PDF of the very same book. So if we had some kind of place where people could share the PDF, and then that doesn't alleviate people, I want to be very clear on this, of the responsibility to own the print copies so it is controlled digital lending and own print copies that are not in circulation. But if we created some system, so the books we've digitized, that you could have the PDFs and then not have to make them yourself and vice versa, and do that on a nationwide scale, we could really step up controlled digital lending. Uh, that that's one way that we could certainly cooperate with each other. I think that's a really interesting idea. I, and I apologize, I don't mean to take over this meeting or continue this conversation, but I would really like to continue this conversation. And I wonder if um, we might, in, if I might entice Michelle Wu um, to join in this conversation from the legality point of view. She's the one that gave us the advice and talked to our vice presidents in order to get them, you know, to say, yeah, Princeton is all in with this. But that yeah. I think might be a useful added voice in the conversation to figure out how we can do what you want to do and how we can do that in a way that protects our uh, institutions as well. Yeah, yeah. I'm happy uh, to reach out to Michelle and see how we can get that going and then to reconnect with you and then Patrick or the executive team of CEPLA can let me know who else would like to be involved in that conversation. And Princeton would clearly have a big target on its back because it has an endowment that could be. That's right. Yeah. I mean, your endowment makes you a target for the bloodthirsty lawyers. Um, that most of the schools that are doing CDL now are doing it sort of quietly, like that CDLI group I was talking about. And there, there are a lot of R1s there that have massive endowments, uh, massive resources, uh, because everybody's sort of saying, let the Internet Archive fight the legal battle here. But the thing is, and this is important for people to understand, it is in our interest to make this standard practice in librarianship because that gives it actually uh, 
existing practice might be nine tenths of the law. <laughs> that, well, this is the way libraries operate today. And if the Internet Archive is the only one who's really doing this and really doing this publicly, then that puts them in a much more vulnerable position. So the more common the practice becomes, the more standardized it becomes, the better its legal standing as the Internet Archives fights through this legal battle over the next several years. But to be clear, the Internet Archive is all in on this. I mean, they, the Brewster has, has a whole team of lawyers that he's paying scads of money to fight this. And I'm pretty confident that CDL will become a given uh, in the time frame going forward. Otherwise, I wouldn't be investing all this money in these print books. Mm -hmm. That's well, well. That's our hope as well with CDL. Yeah. Sorry, but, Patrick. I see. Yeah, you. No, I, I um, uh, Evelyn. I appreciate your your offer um, uh, to meet and um, uh, to to make you know, uh, uh, Michelle Wu, you know, uh, part of that conversation. That, that I think that sounds uh, that makes a lot of sense. It's really exciting as a separate member library um, to uh, uh, to hear uh, about the CDL that's already been going on at Princeton and uh, to have you know, an ATLA um, affiliate um, uh, from, from Claremont and the DTL um, uh, talking about this in earnest. Um, the idea of sharing the PDF, you know, I hadn't heard about that before this meeting and uh, uh, it sounds really innovative in addition to some of the other innovative approaches uh, that we've been hearing about. So, um, so this has been very encouraging. You know, uh, CEPLA many years ago had a um, a robust union catalog of periodicals. Uh, Septal member libraries uh, were uh, uh, vigilant about sharing their resources in, in ways before um, OCLC uh, uh, changed a lot of, of ILL. And I think um, uh, in general, our member libraries would be eager to, uh, uh, to learn more about this and to see how we can get them involved you know, for our mutual, uh, our mutual benefit. And perhaps more broadly, uh, even nationally. So it's a very exciting conversation. I'd like to thank our, our, our guests, Dr. Tom Phillips, for his time today uh, and speaking to us about the DTL. Thank you very much, Tom. Yeah, thanks, Tom. I really appreciate it. Uh, one thing I would say, if, if you're going to do this, uh, you want the libraries to be in control of it, not a third party. Uh, yeah, that, that was one of the things we were emphatic about at the DTL, that the libraries that are members of the DTL are actually the board. It's not a separate board, it is the librarians. Uh, because um, you, you don't want the, you don't want somebody else controlling your collections. Now you may control them collectively, which is what we do in the DTL, but you don't want somebody else who has who owns uh, the rights here and owns the system, and then you're at your mercy, be at their mercy, because uh, even if it's a nonprofit, that's not a good way to go. Uh, the other thing I'd say is if you do this, talk to me because the folks in the SCATLA, Southern California ATLA, may be interested in joining together with you and the kind of project we're talking about. It wouldn't matter, you know, if you're on East Co each coast. Thanks for your time. Oh, very good. Thank you. Again. Uh, Patrick and or uh, Evelyn can either, and Lydia, I know all, and they can put you in touch with me. I'm happy to talk to you. We'll do that. Take care. Thanks again. Well, I'll leave now, okay? <laughs> okay. Okay. Bye. Bye.